Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin, here with the Collider of Thoughts, Teos Avidia, the Super wow. Collider, the Super, super Collider. Super Collider. Yeah, I feel like I'm going to cause a Gamma World uh, explosion. Sean, good to see you, my friend. I uh, I went to my daughter's high school graduation, which I don't know how that's possible because I'm extremely young. So mm-hmm. yes, mm. it's, it's amazing that you could have a child at all much less one that is graduating from high school well congratulations yeah. to her specifically but to you tangentially uh, because you, i'm yeah. sure that she did well despite your parenting as opposed is, to because of it that is astute my friend my very very good friend uh <laughs> yes. thank you for pointing that out yes yeah. she overcame all the hindrances that we put in her way uh and and graduated with I don't know if they did this back in the day. I graduated and, and I think like I had some like minor certificate somewhere that someone shoved at me at one point. My daughter had medals and extra tassels and all kinds of things. And and so apparently she did a good job. Oh yeah. That's, they let me in uh, only because I <laughs> snuck in. <laughs> Otherwise, Wait, that. Yeah. That's, that's how it goes. Skill challenge. Yeah, exactly. Climb over the fence. <laughs> bribe your way past the guard and speaking of questions <laughs> questioning our sanities yes. uh, we have even more and awesome questions coming at us so before we get to the news and to our main topic today let's answer a couple of these questions the first is from eric commander from the official uh misdirectedmark.com website Eric has been listening to all of the episodes going all the way back to when it was down with D&D before <laughs> even I was a host. Wow. Way, I mean, way before you were a host. I don't, that, that's like in a sci-fi movie when you get to the end and there's just like flesh in a tank, you know, because that's yeah. what it's been reduced to. I can only right. imagine the poor state of Eric. So Eric, yeah. uh, wow. Incredible. Yes. What an achievement. Yeah. First of all, thanks for listening and thanks for all the great questions. Uh, So he says, out of the 130 episodes I've listened to, this may have been the most disappointing. And I was like, oh, no, what did we do recently? No, this is one from way back, Uh, even Mm -hmm. though it might have been my favorite topic in one uh, in one of my in one of the series. Uh, I'm referring to specifically how to create rewards that encourage the type of behavior that you want from your players. I really appreciate that you distinguish between milestone XP and session-based and story-based advancement. However, I wish you would have gone deeper into the pros and cons of the various methods of awarding experience. For instance, I've been playing in a story-based advancement campaign, and whenever the DM introduces challenges outside of the core adventure plots, such as those related to character backgrounds, I'm very aware, as much as I overlook it, that there will not be any XP awarded for overcoming these challenges. On the other hand, only awarding XP for defeating monsters lends itself to the murder hobo mentality. Uh, I prefer to use standard XP with a heavy emphasis on non-combat challenges, including personal goals, but the disadvantages that are as more work to maintain and offers more opportunities for characters to differ in total experience. What XP award systems do you prefer and recommend? So great wow. question. Uh, you know, you make a lot of good points, Eric, in what you say. Uh, you know, some of the disadvantages that you, that you show. If you keep track of XP, it's a lot more bookkeeping. You could, if you have players that drop in and out for sessions, uh, get into a situation where you have characters that are higher level and sometimes even much higher or low, lower level than other characters, uh, which can be a problem. Teos, so I'm going to let you start. Uh, we are, what award systems do you prefer or, or recommend? Yeah. Or I mean, you know, over the years, um, I mean, we, we, you know, I played back with basic and, and, and AD and D and things like that, where it was all very much, uh, a big driver was gold, right? Gold mm-hmm. was XP. Uh, but also we didn't just react to gold. Some groups did. Um, we, but we did, we were aware that every monster defeated was 
you know, going into your bank account of XP. And that drove that kind of behavior that did cause to just sort of tear into things. Um, there weren't quest awards. Sometimes DMs would give XP for things like disarming a trap or something that they thought was particularly clever, but it was infrequent enough to not really drive play. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably wasn't until maybe third edition where there started to be things in, in adventures that would say, you know, you get XP for going around this situation, mm -hmm. also for defeating the monster. And that sent a signal to us. I remember it sending a signal that said, okay, you, you, there aren't wrong ways to do this in terms of your accounting. Mm -hmm. And then as I moved into fourth edition, but even a little earlier than that, I just started saying, well, why am I doing this, all of this accounting? It's a lot of work. And I don't always agree with the numbers. And that may be my designer brain kicking in, but I would say, well, you know, this amount here for this fight is higher than the last fight, but the last fight was more challenging. You know, what's the point of this accounting system when it's not even accurate? Why am I doing all this math? And so I just began to say, well, the level when it makes sense to me, which isn't quite milestone XP. Um, it's more just sort of story-based advancement where we're, you know, it feels like you've completed a cool thing to go to the next level. And that's the kind of, of, of path that I use. Mm -hmm. But I'd say, Sean, for me, the more important thing is understanding the system and what it's doing to your game. Mm -hmm. Because I know that there are people out there, I, I read about it all the time, who say, I love XP as a player. Mm -hmm. Knowing that doing this thing gets me this little carrot keeps me going, motivates me. And so if that's the case, cool. Like if that's how most of your players feel and you don't mind doing the math, then that can be a win and just be aware of where the accounting is coming from so you can adjust your game, you know? And so I just think being introspective around it is probably the main thing. Yeah, I, I agree with Teos completely uh, in the sense that what you reward players for will drive what players want to do. And so if giving players xp for defeating monsters makes them feel good and keeps them interested in the game then go ahead and do that um, as long as the burden of making the math work out to what you need to do to get the story in the shape that it needs to be in makes sense for you as a game master and that's one of the the things that i've noticed is you know, if you give XP for monsters and you then give XP for uh, getting around monsters in other ways, and then you give XP for defeating traps, and then you give XP for certain things that they do in the game story-wise, you know, that can all be done reasonably well, but it's incredibly difficult to make it work out if you're trying to keep at a certain pace and you want them at sixth level when you enter this part of the campaign uh, because all you're really doing then is fudging numbers <laughs> to make it work in a way that you're just doing story-based advancement anyway right it's like well they need 500 more xp to get to level six and i want them to level six for this part of the story so i'm going to fudge some numbers and throw one more encounter or just say Hey, you rescued the alchemist, so you get 728 experience points. Oh, look, that puts you exactly at sixth level. Wow, who would have thought? Um, and I think it's telling that the people, the designers at Wizards of the Coast over the years have pretty much gone straight to the story-based leveling. Uh, and just to remind people, we covered this, you know, back in the day where Eric was uh, listening. It's milestone XP is not a, a story based or um, session based leveling. Milestone is you are still using XP. You just give certain events, certain milestones, an XP value, and you level based on that. And so. For me, using milestone-based XP is sort of silly because all you're really doing is setting an XP for the story, which you can just as easily do with story-based without having to keep track of all those numbers. Yeah. Uh, so 
the, the, the real big benefit, as Teo said, is some people need that immediate gratification. Uh, and when I say immediate gratification, you may, it may sound like I'm being sort of snide. And, and I am, uh, right? Because if, if, if they're playing the game to get the XP as opposed to doing cool things and telling cool stories, then you, know, you might want to change the focus of the game. Mm-hmm. If if you need that to keep people involved, keep people's minds you know focused on the challenges at hand, uh, and you know I understand everyone plays different ways, and and uh, you know you you want to play to have the most fun with your group and and how you want to play, uh, but as somebody who's been around the block twenty thousand times with different campaigns and different ways of playing Um, the way that keeps people uh, happiest in my estimation is the cool stories that you get to tell. Yeah. And there's definitely lots of combat involved. There's all these sorts of things, but that's where the focus of the game seems to resonate the most with the most number of people. Yeah, and a system isn't necessarily perfect, right? So when I ran Tomb of Annihilation, uh, my players wanted to begin at third level. Like that's that's a thing that came out in session zero, even pre-zero uh, design, and and where I poll them about what kind of things they want. And so I said, okay, but this adventure ends at tenth, and I don't really want to spend time rejiggering reconfiguring all of the end encounters like i don't want to do that i don't want to redo the whole tomb right Right. so the adventure will end at 10th which means you'll level very slowly and you're not going to level to fourth for a while because i don't want to redo all this world um that is not where i want to put my fun i want to put my fun into it in fact expanding the adventure so there'll be even more content that you'll level less for right and you know and so they said okay fine and, and again, my emphasis was just story. Like, did you have a great story? Great. You know, and, and every now and then we're going to say that story is so phenomenal that you leveled and that'll be at my discretion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had a great campaign, so it all worked just fine. And, and I was happy with it, but for sure they wanted, uh, I think probably, you know, two out of five wanted to have, uh, and maybe three out of six wanted to have um, XP. Like they would have liked those amounts coming in their way. Uh, and they all wanted to level faster, mm-hmm. but you know, you are the DM, you have to decide what you're going to be happy with. And, and, right. and, and I don't know that perfection could be achieved because maybe had I embraced what they wanted, I may have been unhappy enough that then I didn't do all those other things that made the game what it was. Yeah. And the more granular a system you make where every XP counts and is important, the more granular you get, the harder it is to make things work. And if yeah. you think it's imperfect as is, try to make a really granular system. That's really, <laughs> really imperfect. Um, and for, I'm going to say for folks that who, who, you know, played back then, we can often forget the layers of things that created our old experiences. So like advances and dragons are basic. Every class was advancing at different le- rates. Mm-hmm. So the, your level was almost a meaningless number as, as a sort of party because it was so bizarre and someone might be dual classing or multi-classing and, and they might hit a cap. And, and, you know, there were just so many ways that XP could sort of be strange. Right. Uh, I mean, and it was ill-designed, right? It wasn't perfect design or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so because the system was so bizarre, it really almost didn't matter what level the characters were in these experiences, which made it much easier to just award XP for every goblin or every gold piece or every whatever, because it's sort of its own little fun mini game. And the power level was much, much slower in how it rose, right? Right. A 10th to a 15th level character, there wasn't such a drastic difference as now that you couldn't just throw the same monsters at them anyway. And it was probably a big dungeon crawl. So it it just felt like another room. And if you threw in one more room, what, you know, who's to say what anything is. So, yeah. 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 So great question. I mean, we could do shows, yeah. uh, plural <laughs> shows exactly. on this. And, uh, but we'll get on to the next question from Matt Martin on YouTube. Uh, great podcast. I think I have some similar feelings about feats. I think they just feel very confused about what they are. And overall, they all feel really underwhelming lately. 
Some feats are so very, very powerful and other feats are really, really weak. And then the cost to get a feat is so high. I started with 5e, so I think what I'm going to ask for is basically what older editions did and what 5e tried to solve, but I'd like to see more opportunities to get more feats, even if that meant feats did less. Is that just what 3.5 did? Was it actually a big mess? Uh, <laughs> is there ultimately no answer to this? Are we just on a pendulum swinging back and forth in the other direction now? Jeez, uh, it's like Martin just peeled back the layer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, th- these questions are pretty much spot the curtain. on. Um, yeah, yeah, they're great questions. For, for and, and, and geez, and I, I think I think probably every fifth edition designer, and, and this this came to from a, the show that where we talked, our last show where we talked about the giant uh, unearthed right. arcana feats. Yeah. And I bet every fifth edition uh, designer asks themselves these types of questions. You know, are we just on a pendulum? What is the answer to this design? And it's a hard question. Yeah, so so feats really started in third edition, as far as I can remember, and they they're there for a reason. I think that is a noble design reason, which is to make the exact sort of character that you want to have your fighter be different than the next player's fighter by adding these feats, these little changes. Uh, or what should be little changes <laughs> that give you a, a, a mechanical, but also a flavorful push in a different direction. Yeah. The problem though, is that in doing so, you are adding complexity to this machine. And by adding the complexity, you are making, min, uh, you're making, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here you are making maximized choices or minimized choices. You are making things that are obviously much better and things that are obviously not as powerful. Now, what is useful and what is powerful can always depend on the campaign, the type of campaign you're playing. Having three extra languages might be the thing that saves your cam- you know, party in a campaign, but that's highly unlikely as opposed <laughs> yeah. to having power attack where you can do 10 extra points of damage every time you swing your sword. Uh, that's more likely to save your characters in the long run in most types of campaigns. So by adding that complexity, by adding that way to make these tweaks, again, which is a noble thought, uh, you end up making a system that is mechanically less robust than the reason that it's there to solve. Yeah, and 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 to frame this in third edition, so in in previous games, including previous RPGs, or even in second edition as part of its skills and powers, what you would often see in a game was that there was some sort of way by which you could get a benefit, might not be called a feat, uh, usually by trading off something else. So you'd take a flaw and you'd get an advantage, something like that, and and that's where this kind of concept of feats, as as I know, uh, came from. Um, and what feats in third edition were really doing was formalizing that each class would give you some number of them at a particular level based on the class's overall design. And what this allowed you to do is, for example, the fighter in third edition, every level granted it a feat, I believe, um, because what that was doing was compensating for the spells and other features that classes got. So a druid might not be getting a feat this level because it's getting wild shape. But what that allowed the fighter to be is no longer be, I just hit it with whatever weapon I'm, I'm carrying an ideal damage, which is if you go back to old uh, original Dungeons and Dragons, the white box set, every weapon did the same amount of damage. So it didn't matter what you did and you just hit things and, 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 you know, it could be a shoe. It would do one D six damage. And so in, in, we get to where in third edition, you are really saying like, I want to be this great weapon fighter, or I want to be the shield tank kind of character or whatever. And you could put it together and feats had chains. So you could take an initial feat, which would unlock another feat. And then after that, you could lock, unlock another. And through this method of prerequisites, power was supposed to be controlled. But because you're rewarding for that chain of feet choices that you made, usually the last one was really powerful. And often the designers made mistakes and they might not think about how one thing interacted with another. And then you ended up with just absurd, absurd things. And third edition, 
really had some unbelievably absurd choices that you can go up, you know, and look up things like pun pun mm-hmm. uh, on the internet and old uh, character creations that are just absurd. You know, there were builds like you would get a companion and your companion did more damage than you did because your role was to buff it and just wild. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not what the game really wants. While those things can be fun for certain players that is destructive to the game's longevity and to the game's enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think recent design tries to curtail feats and put them into a different category. And that's why with fifth edition, you see this idea of, do you want two ability bumps or do you want a feat? And you're only getting them at certain levels and every class is getting them at the same time because they're supposed to play a more relegated role. And in fact, the entire thing of feats in fifth edition is being optional. Exactly. So you can live without them. Yeah. What we've often reacted to in the show is that increasingly it looks like maybe Wizards is starting to change its mind as to whether this is optional. Right. Um, and we've heard from DMs who, while, while the vast majority seem to use feats, there are many who don't. And they're quite nervous about what this does because it does really change that, that the math of the game and the feel of the game, the complexity of the game, and the abuse you're going to see in the game. Yeah, and Taylor's made a great point there about 5th edition feats being optional. Because I had a really good point here, and it just went right out of my head. Um, <laughs> well, the, the designers saw what happened in third edition and fourth edition. But one thing that feats do, uh, how do you get mechanical options in d d In fifth edition, you get them through your class. You get them through what was originally called race. And you get them through backgrounds. Magic items may give you some things, but for the, for the most part, those three things give you everything your character can do. So what feats do is add ways to add abilities to your character, which some people love. They love to tinker. They love to find either the cool thing or the most powerful thing. Uh, but having seen what happened in third and fourth edition with feats, the fifth edition designers were like, okay, let's make this optional. Uh, that way, game masters can say, no, thanks. We'll just use the the stat bumps and we'll let the classes and the race and the backgrounds carry the weight. However, what happens in, with most things in life when you take something cool, but you make it optional? Everyone wants that. Everyone wants that optional thing. They want that extra thing. They want that thing, whether it's yeah. g- great for the game or not, you know, they just want it because it's there. So it's like candy, right? We shouldn't right. eat it. None of us should. We know that we reach for the candy bowl knowing this is a terrible idea, right? But it's so sweet in the mouth. And so we grab it and we right. eat it. And, and the problem is done at some point, people do not understand that candy is bad for you. They, they, they don't learn because candy is just foisted upon us in our society <laughs> by big candy, I guess, uh, you know, so <laughs> if we want to get political, you know, so, so it's like, they don't even realize that, that what they're doing, it tastes so good. It's, it can't be that bad for me. Right. Uh, and sometimes we get that with game design, right? You, you have this thing. It feels so good to get that extra 10 points of damage, you know, when, when you swing that great weapon. Um, yeah. But how, is it good for your game as a whole? Right. Do we stop and think about it or just we say, we're doing this for fun. So I want to have the biggest numbers I can. Cool. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I mean, I am not sitting on some high horse on a soapbox here. I mean, I have my highest level character is a ranger with sharpshooter mm-hmm. and it, I have no problem compensating for the penalty to hit. And I get Mm -hmm. to add that damage to a whole slew of attacks. I'm often shooting a whole mess of an impossible number of arrows in a round. Mm -hmm. And they all get that boost to damage. And it is kind of fun, you know. But while I know it's bad, I mean, that's me eating candy, right? And in third edition, I had a ranger with, you know, weapons that had all the bonuses on them to complement what I was doing. And then I would have all these buffs and the damage was so high. I kept it on a spreadsheet with yep. color-coded dice, and I would get the DM's approval before the game began to be like, hey, here's yep. how I run this for speed so yep. I can pull it off. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, to be clear, it, as long as everyone at the table is cool with this, 
that's fine. You know, do, do your great weapon fighter, do your sharpshooter, do, do all of it. If you're at your home game and everyone's happy and it's when you get people of different power levels playing with each other and yeah. seeing that, you know, this person is just doing everything and I'm doing nothing and well, I can't yeah. control, I'm not the game master, so I can't really control it. It just, it feels like, you know, you're just the yeah. the assistant to this character that's doing everything. Yeah, that, that's that, that's a really good point. That, that, that I think there are there are three sort of big areas where I see this. Two of which Sean just mentioned. So one is when you have one player that is overshadowing others, or uh, or overshadowed by others. When you have that dichotomy, right? That is really painful. I've been at that game, and it's not fun. Um, another is where the DM wants to run a particular type of game. And the players aren't playing that game, right? Mm-hmm. So this is like, say, for example, where everybody banishes and counter spells all the mm-hmm. time. And the DM really wants to have fun with like a cool wizard who shows up and, and is dangerous. And, and, and no, not, no s- single monster could be dangerous to the party, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third thing is, is a more, it's a thing where we sort of don't realize, like we're all having fun and we're all, you know, but, but we... We are playing a certain type of game when we actually probably would like a different type of game better, but we don't know how to get to that type of game because the system itself is preventing it with the way the system and the players are interacting prevents us from getting that other game. And so I think, you know, you can look to live streaming where I think a lot of people today are watching these live stream games and they say, Ooh, I want that. I want to have that kind of game. And then when they play at their table, they're not at that kind of game at all. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is because they're, they're, in, they're playing a more mechanical game and a mechanically focused game, and they don't know how to get to that story level. And it's hard to if you're spending your whole time counting your temporary hit points and firing off your artificer cannon and doing your, you're doing all this mechanical stuff when you could be, play, you could be spending your time elsewhere, right, at the table. And, and, and that's the kind of stuff that when I look at this design, I see fifth edition increasingly feeling more like fourth edition, which is fine. I loved fourth edition and, and happy birthday to fourth edition, which was uh, on uh, uh, today, like 18 years ago as time of recording. Yeah. Um, but the fourth edition was doing a specific thing and fifth edition at its initial writing was doing a specific thing. And I think that's the strength of fifth edition is doing that thing it was doing. Mm-hmm. And the more that it, tries to feel like other editions i think that's shaky ground to walk upon it could very well pull it off Mm -hmm. but it is it it is kind of playing out of its element and out of its strength and maybe even eroding that strength yeah so to bring that all back around to feats right (laughs) feats are are there to to differentiate rather than elevate a character and unfortunately many times feats end up elevating rather than differentiating. And there is not the hardest design thing to do is to differentiate without elevating. Because uh, yeah. if, if it was easy to do, then we would all have thousands of feats and we'd feel like the coolest characters ever, but we wouldn't be overpowered as opposed to other characters or the rest of the game. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're there for a noble reason again but i don't know if their end result is the noble reason that that we go into them for i mean it's like ability scores right you, you start creating your ability scores for a character and you say okay you know they're probably this level of smart and this part and then you start going well but if i give myself one more ability point here mm-hmm. then i get plus blah yeah oh that'd be really good that bump up my ac yeah. and my initiative and and then you yep. just find yourself shaving off your character concept because you want those points and that's that's yeah. how all of this works right, right. and and right. and the tough part of designing is trying to minimize that behavior and maximize what we all say we want when we sit down i'm not gonna eat that candy i'm gonna have a good nutritious meal and then i'm gonna exercise and yeah yeah yeah, it, it's that constant tension between the narrative that comes out of playing and the game that is the engine that drives that narrative. That that yeah. tension is always there. It's always going to be there. And how that tension is managed 
uh, between the game and the story that evolves from the game, uh, it will constantly be at odds. Well All right. said. So we go then to our news section. Let's start with D&D Beyond adding a how to play D&D page. Uh, this new web page walks a new gamer through the process of creating a new character, including links to guides for how to find a group, what books to start with, best campaigns for a beginner DM, and a link to the new free basic rules. Yeah, pretty cool. That is a good first uh, use of D&D Beyond to, to come into the wizard's fold and try to get new people uh, into playing games. Yeah, I like it. Neat Can idea. Can I do that? Yep. Um, so Tyler Walpole is creating new D&D cartoon play mats. You want to tell us about this? Yeah, so he was the official D&D cartoon illustrator for the recent uh, Magic the Gathering card set. It's part of their secret layers that was all about the D&D cartoons. There's just a few cards, but they're really cool, really nice looking uh, in the style of the original D&D cartoons. And he, he has the ability to, to make more art based on that. So he's now preparing to crowdfund a set of play mats that feature those characters. And they're going to apparently have some sort of augmented reality option. And just in case folks don't know, it, a quite fun thing you can do is to buy a play mat that is either, like, say, one of these D&D cartoon ones, or even they exist for all of the D&D hardcover books, or most of them. Um, and these play mats work great as extended mouse, mouse pads, so they can go under your keyboard and mouse, and you can have, you know, a large surface to use your mouse on. They, they deaden sound, so they're good when you're recording. I have a big one that's done with the Ack Inc. book uh, that my wife made custom. Um, so it's a fun thing. So we've got a link to, to where you can check out, uh, get alerted when this crowdfunding for these um, play mats goes there. But you can also find them in other kinds already for existing books. Nice. Uh, next bit of news is a new crowdfunding site launching this month, month called Crowdfunder. That's crowd, F-U-N-D-R. Uh, Jen Vaughn, a well-known writer and game designer, announced she is working at Crowdfunder, which is a new branch of an existing company called Fundraiser, also without the E or the O at the end. Uh, they hate E's, Sean. Yes, Why? yes. Uh, this site says it is designed with creators in mind, including gamers and game producers. Uh, the site promises patron management, backer management, inventory management, shipping integration, and other features. So, you know, with Kickstarter treading dangerously close to getting into blockchain and and that sort of technology, uh, we will be keeping a close eye on Crowdfunder to see if it fits the bill for uh, creators out there. Yeah, very cool. Tell us, um, what, tell us what DM David's up to. Yeah, yeah. So he wrote a blog post about his recent adventure, Battle Walker from the Abyss, which we covered recently. Um, and... In this blog, he talks about the influences he used for writing this high-level adventure, which you can get on the DMs Guild. And in addition to showcasing kind of what each of the influences uh, provides, which is really cool and, and useful or useful read just for that, I love it. I love this piece just as a fascinating look at how you know a single adventure that he's writing has all of these different influences yeah. and they're everything from you know mike shea on how to um approach a certain type of structure to specific adventures or the use of a source book by I ashley warren or uh the adventure dead gods which is the sequel to modron march mm -hmm. um so I, I highly recommend taking a look at this on the dmdavid.com site it's a good read awesome uh and finally last bit of news here there was an article on Medium a couple of weeks ago that urged RPG companies to sponsor streaming and streamers. Um, Ian Muller was the author of this article. And, uh, you know, it basically claims that, yes, it will cost you something, RPG companies, to sponsor streamers and streams, but it, the cost will be justified in the end. Uh, and he, of course, said talent should be paid. And it should pay well, it should pay properly. And, you know, he, Ian draws data that about 2,500 uh, viewers are watching streams daily, with 75% of those uh, views being watching D&D &D specifically. And then he admitted that we have no data on whether 
these actual play streams sell games or not. Uh, and that, as g- all good, interesting articles do, brought some response. <laughs> and I will, I will let Teos cover the response to that. Yeah, so Justin Alexander of Atlas Games, who also has his own great website, uh, he said, well, you know, we tried this at Atlas Games and it didn't create any sales. And he did a really neat kind of breakdown that I thought was very useful. So we've got a link to that as well here. Uh, that you want a return of five to one. You spend a dollar, get five dollars back, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, two to one can work in very special situations, but generally you want five to one. And in the RPG industry, a $5, $5 is a ballpark for what you get, what you get to keep when you sell a $50 book. Right. This is after you account for the 60% of the distributor, the cost to make the product, all of that. So every dollar you spend in marketing, if it's going to be a five to one return, that $1 in marketing has to basically be a sale of a book. Right. I thought it was really interesting math, right? Yep. Um, and a great marketing conversion would be that if you reach an audience, 10% of that audience buys the book. So if Atlas were to spend $250 to sponsor an actual play, this all means it needs to reach an audience of 2,500 people so that that 10% will buy the book. Right. And he said, I don't know that we're going to reach 2,500 people. Probably not. And I don't believe 10% of those people are going to buy a book. Well, so go- it's yeah. failing. If we go back to what Ian said, that 2,500 viewers watch streams daily, that means every single one of those people would have to be watching your stream. Yeah, and and, and, um, Justin points out there are some streams out there uh, that do have that kind of viewership, but they cannot be sponsored for 250 bucks. You're now spending a lot higher money to reach them, as some companies know. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, you know, when you start getting into that kind of spend that will get you possibly that kind of return, there are just better options out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so be- these two have, have created a, a pretty good conversation. There have been other participants who, who got into it. Um, it has certainly led to some good results. Like I've seen Monty Cook Games talking about what they can do to support. And they already have some sort of official slash unofficial like discord level promotion and stuff they do. But I think that maybe some companies might look at ways that they can do this, but effectively and efficiently, right? I think this idea of just sponsor a whole bunch of people to stream your game for most companies probably doesn't pay off uh, for the reasons that Justin shared. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to think about this and, and yeah, this whole conversation to me, I think is, is really fascinating around that illusion that 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 can be out there of of well just do this and money will come <laughs> yeah it's there there's reasons why there's you know whole marketing courses right there's mba programs that teach you how to evaluate these things and having worked in the software industry both on sort of the sales and marketing side of things and on the the technical creation uh you know side of things as a QA person, as a project manager. Uh, yeah, there, there are some really hard numbers. And you, it just really shows that while the role-playing game industry may be growing, uh, we are still not anywhere near anything close to a, right. an industry that can support the, this, sort, this sort of content and do it in a way that the content creators deserve, you know, pay for, for their work. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hard. Cause you know, this podcast, Teos and I are making it in hand over fist. Um, <laughs> I don't think it pays for the electricity that, that we use. No. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And, but, and there's no, literally no model under which it would. Exactly. Right. I mean, outside of completely changing everything and having sponsorships every five seconds or something like that. And I don't even know that the companies could afford to give us that. So it's just, right. yeah, it's, it's really funny how this industry works because it, its scale is just so different than anything else. And, yeah. 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 So that, you know, great conversation. You can find that article on medium.com and we have a link in the show notes. So our main topic, we are finally going to conclude the great Modron March. Um, We looked at the uh, first chapter and then the first couple of adventures last time. So we wanted to do a quick rundown of the rest of the book. Uh, We're going to, you know, talk about this like we did before. 
um, we are going to try to focus more on not just you know what's wrong with this or what's cool about it, but <laughs> but how how to if you were going to update this really cool adventure for five E and for you know twenty first century role playing game play, yeah. how you would do it? Yeah, because you know the premise is great, right? And in, in case you missed it or in case it, it's gotten a little fuzzy, the whole idea is the Modron March happens on this very regular schedule, like clockwork. Well, all of a sudden it doesn't. It shows up early and the Modrons are on their march and nobody's prepared for it across all of the planes. And this is a planescape cap- campaign. So you're probably sitting in sigil uh, and suddenly there's this massive disruption which causes all this political change. The, all of the planes are in chaos, right? It's a cross-planar chaos because of this. And through a variety of reasons, what the, the, the adventure tries to do is from a variety of, of reasons, you're going to be pulled into the various steps of the march, not all of them, but close to all of them, as you go through uh, for one reason or another and have to be involved in it, whether it's protecting them or stopping them or rerouting them. And, and, and yeah, so that's the promise. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and it's a good promise. Yeah, right. <laughs> so how would we do that? Yeah, so uh, just one more thing. Like the Spelljammer adventure that we talked about, this is really a product of its time. And I don't even mean that in terms of the def- different isms that have been, you know, brought to light over the years. Just in terms of gameplay, both the Spelljammer adventure and this adventure are about the setting. They're about creating a setting that's very, very different from the typical D and D settings that we were used to when these came out. So, you know, Spelljammer wanted to focus on, hey, you're flying on this spaceship, flying ship. Uh, isn't that cool? And you're going off into the ether. And with this, it's each plane is different. And there are all these strange and wonderful things that are happening on these different planes. So in the, with the goal of highlighting those things, you sometimes lose the agency that the, that you should be bringing to the players to make decisions and to do what their characters would want to do as opposed to making this sort of a stroll, a safari through the different yeah. planes and what's cool or strange about them. And, and I think this chapter four, the adventure politics of the beast is probably a great example of that where the, the concept is noble, but as it tries to wrestle with how to make the beast lands where it takes place come to, to be, to be tangible to the players, it, it, gets it doesn't stay in control of itself and therefore creates a very linear experience yeah when, when i saw the title i was like politics of the beast that that i mean you know in a way that's right oxymoronic right beasts should not have politics beasts mm-hmm. should be chaotic and, and wild and and immune to politics so it's like okay is this going to be a cool juxtaposition uh or is this going to be like <laughs> A, a hot mess and and it's it's really neither it's it's neither you know this brilliant thing or a mess it's well there is a quote from the adventure itself that sort of put some some things up for me which says this adventure introduces the pcs to the intricate ecosystem of the beast lands demonstrating the careful balance of nature and what can happen if that balance is upset and I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. Then this next sentence is the DM can also use it as a lesson in chaos theory or an, an, or an empirical example of the unity of rings. And I'm like, how about just, Hey, here's a fun adventure for characters to play (laughs) rather than a lesson in chaos theory. Uh, So here's, here's the plot. I think it's a good plot. Uh, a lake nymph is dying because the Modrons are polluting the water that feeds into her lake. There's a river that runs into her lake. The Modrons are marching up the river, polluting her uh, thing. And the characters have a limited amount of time to save her. How they get to her can be done through the DM in a variety of ways. She supposedly has information or can grant them a wish or something. So they go and she's sick. They have to save her. Okay, cool. So the task then is to get the Modrons out of the river. All right. They're marching through this river. On one side, there are these wild dogs 
that are a faction. On the other side, there's the there are these druids, and neither side will let the Modrons leave the river onto their side of the river. So we can't. And, and to be clear, that's the yeah. kind of won't because the adventure tells you anything the characters do will fail, which yeah. is always a tough situation when you've literally created like story walls to block action. Mm-hmm. So w- just think for a moment how your characters, you're the DM or you're a player, how are you going to handle this? The first thing you do is talk to the Modrons and the Modrons say, we'd love to leave the river. We got blown off course and we're just getting to where we need to go. Uh, so to the right, to the left, we can't go either way. So we're just going up the river. So you go to both sides and both sides tell you, no, we're not letting them. You can't do anything to convince them. You can't do anything to change this. But the, it is suggested, quote, that you follow the chain of events and attempt to unravel it from the beginning. So what the adventure forces the players to do is backtrack and figure out what drove these Modron off course. That's on the scale of what the, our character is most likely to do or is least likely to do. Going back, getting behind the problem rather than in front of the problem Lord, yeah. is like the least thing that the characters would likely do. So I understand the adventure is the adventure concept is interesting in this sense to go back and find out, you know, the mystery of why they're off course, but it's such an anti game, right? Anti cool story way to handle this when time is running out on the, on this nymph. All right. I'm going to take a drink and you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the end of this is, is reminds me of several Shadowrun adventures I've played where the whole summary of the adventure is basically, if I had just stayed home, this would have gone better than by my active involvement. And it, this feels like that kind of gotcha sort of reveal, which is the elves, you're going to go to the Wemmicks. The Wemmicks say, yeah, we drove them there, but we did this because of the winged elves. And you go to the elves and the elves tell you that the Modrons were born, blown off course by a mortal, uh, a morti called Breath of Life. And then you're going to find that Breath of Life says, I did this because the lake nymph didn't want the Modrons polluting the river and lake. So it's all this circular thing, Mm -hmm. which is pretty dissatisfying. (laughs) This is like a ha ha, but that's not what the players want, right? Like, right. And, and it can be interesting. I think it, if it's overdone, Right. If this is the first time that the players ever ran into a story like this, mm. the first time you're like, oh, that's pretty clever. The, the problem is that, that nothing that they could do along the way made any difference, except the fact that they have to then go back to the right. lake nymph and tell her to tell the breath of life, to tell the elves, to tell the Wemix, to tell the Modrons that it's okay if they come back. So it's you go in this reverse circle, then you have to take the circle back the other way. And yeah. at no time in any of there is there an actual encounter, right? right? An encounter in the sense where, you know, there's a goal, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's a challenge to overcome. It's basically just talk to the people. It's not, oh, we will help you if you go do this thing. It's not take on this ritual and we will... There's no cool role playing. There's no cool combat. There's no cool exploration. It's just and and there aren't story. really clear. The problem when when you set up the story to say to the D, to to through the DM through the voice of the DM, the story is saying to the players, "No, that doesn't work." When you say no, oh no over and over again, mm-hmm. and then there's only a nebulous way that you're supposed to connect to the next progress, mm-hmm. it it really falls apart. Um, and it's not that you have to have, in fact, this is very linear, right? But, but it's not that you have to have a linear plot that leads to yes, yes, yes. It's more that you, you want to enable natural things the characters will want to do into rewarding results, even if they fail, 
but some mm -hmm. sort of result that will give them feedback so they know what to do next right. so that it kind of makes sense. And that what to do could be one of three options or it could be wide open, but, but it leads forward and, it, and it's, what the, it's in the direction of what the characters naturally want to do. And this is not doing that, right? It's just, it's no, 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 no. Uh, then a, a sort of cryptic answer that leads, is supposed to lead to another cryptic answer and then eventually to the circular logic. Um, yeah, this is probably my least favorite of, of these. Uh, you know, and when it comes to what would we do, um, I would I would disassemble this and and reassemble it based on its parts. I think that the idea of a nymph being threatened is interesting, uh, but I would come up with a different plot that is it allows you to to move forward and progress forward along these lines. Um, and anything it can be just an, an old rift between two people that needs to be healed or something else that the the party can actually do things right use their skills and 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 enact a change so that that leads to the modrons getting back on course yeah it's it's a it's a tough one to just snap your fingers and fix mm -hmm. because the intricacy of the story is the story and so to take away that intricacy is to take away the entire story and have to rebuild it from scratch yeah uh so so it's, you also point something out here which i think is a, a, a an important thing in stories is that don't suddenly have a reveal about the creatures which may not even be canonical right so this is all about modrons polluting if they're polluting here they've got to have been polluting everywhere mm -hmm. right which is what you point out here in the show notes and don't introduce things like that because it it just I, and modrons are supposed to be really kind of higher functioning creatures right they're all they're magical they're mm -hmm. they're unbelievable they're they're sort of perfection of mechanism and law mm -hmm. they they really shouldn't pollute yeah there's no reason for it they shouldn't eat either which is also described at some point that they sort of don't need to but do it, it's a weird sort of comment just d don't don't get into additional reasoning stick to the reasons that work and, and don't mm -hmm. it's like a it's like a things in, in plots of TV shows, right? Where when these right. kinds of things come up, they just create trouble because now players will expect this to be a situation from yeah. here on out. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's problematic, but... Oh, the, the one other thing was, this is the beast land, right? This is, this is the area of chaos. Not pure chaos. It's not limbo, but it's, right, chaotic good. It's, it's, yeah. it's the wild. It's, it's the... The, it's the intricacy of nature and the modrons everywhere else the modrons are like we're not doing anything differently ever than than we do we're marching and you can't stop us <laughs> here the reason they actually do go off course first they are actually blown off course but they could go right back on course right but they have treaties with some of these peoples the winged elves and the and the lion folk. And so instead of just going, well, we can go right back on course and get out of the river. It's like, well, we have this treaty with these chaotic people. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> Beastlands is not art. It's not about these treaties, right? Beastlands is about the laws of the jungle. Right. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I, and then it just goes, we'll just create a new treaty to solve every future problem. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. It's, it, I could see this being a lot of fun with a, with a little more agency and a little more uh, creative problem solving from the players and the DM to, to iron out some of these wrinkles. So, Sean, this next one, Chapter 5, I think we could probably do pretty quickly. And the, the, yeah. the main thing it hinges on is that um, there is supposed to be a friend of the PCs who is captured. Mm -hmm. And I think the main thing that really stuck out to us is that this they, they, the adventure chooses to just make up mm -hmm. an NPC that is supposed to be your friend. And that's a weird thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Just just introduce this person in the first chapter and have yeah. them pop in every now and then. So they the uh, adventurers go to this place where it's nonstop party. Uh, and the, the NPC that we're introduced to loves to party. So she drags the characters to the party and all this wild partying is going on. And all of a sudden... 
the NPC is gone. Uh, it's a little tough to uh, to reconcile someone who is sort of drops in and out of the character's lives and is supposedly wild and will disappear for long stretches of time. And the whole trigger is she disappears. It's like, that's who she is. Um, so you will have to, as the DM, establish your character earlier and then make it so that the characters will notice that she's gone. <laughs> and but, think they, <laughs> but they can't notice it while it happens because then they may stop the kidnapping from happening. So uh, that if you can get that part ironed out, the rest of it sort of points back to the previous uh, one of the previous adventures where the parts of the Modrons are being grafted onto other people to make new creatures. Well, this person who is doing it in this adventure, sort of her, uh, his notes were stolen by the Takarum to do their experiments. So it's, it's another uh, one along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. However, so, on, on the plus side, you do actually get to go into a stronghold. It almost feels like a dungeon and rescue people and find out what's happening. So in that sense, we, we do get some actual something that resembles a D&D game, um, which I thought was cool. Yeah, and, and there are a couple of those in this adventure that, that do kind of take you away from sort of the, the wilds of some plane and into a location. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then again, that's what makes it difficult to sort of say, well, what is the story of this place? Um, and can you, do you actually feel like you're in there? Like, I think we're supposed to be in like near Arborea in this mm -hmm. adventure, is that right, yep. Sylvania? Yep. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the, the touchy part is then if you're in just a dungeon, well, do you get to feel the place? Right. You certainly feel the place in chapter six, okay. Lion Chaos. So I like part of this and it reminds me of a lot of sort of old school play where it's just sort of, you're, you're writing a concept and you write it hard, which is yep. you are entering limbo and this is the, you know, the home of the Slotty and, and other right. super chaotic creatures. Right. And limbo is all these chaotic elements just intermixing and just, it's a soup of things being torn and assembled and everything. And the hilarious premise is that all these creatures of that normally live here are concerned that the Modron's entering will taint the plane. Mm -hmm. So these chaotic factions are hiring you to get the Modron's through as quickly as possible. That's a premise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. This is why, I mean, this is one of the many reasons why alignment just not, I understand the the appeal of it and the sort of fun metaphysical debates that can go on with it. But yeah, taken to the extreme, you get things like this. You get pure chaotic people coming together yeah. to hire you, to make a contract with you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you get a group. So the idea is that a bunch of people have been hired. You're one of these groups that's hired and you have to escort your group of Modrons. Um, and to do it, you use, this goes back to the Planescape rules for shaping the chaos of Limbo, where you sort of exert your mental influence, which is something the Modrons are ill-equipped to do. You, you focus on the, the bizarre chaotic landscape and you make it into, say, solid ground, mm -hmm. right? Instead of fire and ice and stuff like that. Um, and you have to get through there. And of course, there's some threats, some monsters that try to attack you and, and an assassin and, and stuff like that. Um, I generally like the concept. This is the kind of thing that it, it doesn't, it's fun enough that it probably doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense. You know, sure. most characters, especially back then, will just enjoy the idea of, of exerting their influence. I, I think you could add to this. This is a one you could add more to and, and have specific scenes where, where you feel what limbo is and, and what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but it generally works. It's fine. Yeah, I think that uh, that's the vibe I'm getting from all of these is trying to turn them into a full campaign would be about as much work as creating a new campaign all your own. <laughs> uh, so, you know, pulling pieces out and and doing them as one shots or doing them as parts of, of a different campaign that you think they would fit into is a good idea. 
Mm -hmm. whereas trying to bring them all together would be would be tough yeah which i kind of wish the adventure had actually done yeah <laughs> i think a modern version might try to do that yeah um the next one is called the modron judge and this is an interesting take where long ago in the outlands the, on a previous uh iteration of the the um the modron march they captured one of the modrons and sort of forced it to become their judge which is sort of weird because they're not super lawful people but they were like well this we need this thing to sort of settle legal issues right. and the modron wants to escape and rejoin the march even though it's technically gone rogue by now um so it concocts a way to have the pcs framed for a crime they did not commit so that they have to go before the judge and then uh lib help them escape you know it's fun i think that can work it's it's got some rough edges here uh but in general i think if you just modernize a little bit of these different encounters to feel a little more reactive to the PC's ideas mm -hmm. uh, rather than prescriptive, right? Because a lot of it is sort of, and then this will happen. Yeah. Um, then that can become, you know, quite fun as you're trying to escape uh, the Outlands, in this town in the Outlands with, with the Modron. Um, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't give us a whole lot of what's going to happen to this Modron. And I think that could have been a nice thing to follow up on further, right? And maybe this Modron comes forward and helps you and yeah. Yep. So in, in those first seven adventures, we, we've covered the lawful areas, we've covered the pure chaotic areas. Now we're down and we're bending the corner into the evil areas, start uh, going into, of all places, the abyss. And uh, what, what did this chapter, this chapter is... eight... This might be my favorite in terms of just how it's executed as written. Um, I think it's a quite clever concept, which is that the abyss is supposed to twist the magic that you cast. And so a wizard, we're told that basically there are all these what they call camp followers, but people who are following along the march, which seems a really foolhardy thing to do. But apparently people will do that to try to learn things or whatever, be part of this party that's following them. So now they enter the abyss and you better be pretty powerful to do this. So this wizard summons uh, monsters to his aid, casts a summoning spell to protect itself from whatever in the abyss may attack it. And what that spell gets twisted into is a spell that pulls the player characters mm -hmm. and forces them to serve it. And it has a number of ways where it explains, and, and, and even the wizard, she explains to the party, you know, you must do my bidding because of my summoning spell. And this is in fact true, but she also says, and you must serve me for one week. And when she says that, you, the, the DM is instructed to tell all the players, you immediately know you are only bound for a day. Hmm. And you don't have to say anything about this, right? So the wizard thinks she's got you for a week. You're only there for a day. And you can use that to your advantage to sort of prolong how quickly you go through, you know, slow down your progress through this adventure, and then you'll wink out. Uh, so she has decided that while she is in the abyss, she wants to go to this place called the Fortress of the Fallen Stair. And it's full of, you know, wacky planescape ideas. Uh, they kind of work as long as you don't overthink it, kind of mm -hmm. like the blood war itself. Mm -hmm. And she wants to reclaim a book that's in this place. So you go through various dangers. It's sort of dungeon crawling. And when you get to the end, you face an Arcanaloth who has the book. And you're kind of told if the party delayed in some way because of this whole week versus day thing they actually disappear as the battle begins mm -hmm. and they and leaves that wizard to be shredded i guess by the arcanaloth uh but if they didn't then you have to face this arcanaloth <laughs> yeah I, I i like this idea um as sort of a right if if they had been summoned and it's like you have to serve her for a full week period people might be grumbly. They still might be grumbly, but having that secret of you're really yeah. only in servitude for a day, uh, that that's clever. And I think a lot of, especially players that love role-playing could really have a field day with that. Yeah. So we have three left. I'll go through these quickly, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Chapter nine, sidetracked. The Modrons know all kinds of secret portals between planes. I like this hook a lot. So they know things because they do this all the time and because they're privy to sort of the secrets of the laws of the universe and how the universe works or multiverse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they sometimes will take a jaunt that nobody knew existed, a portal that was hidden from everybody. 
And in this case, this has happened and you are hired to figure out how they went through um, in, in this particular plane. And you find a guide, an anarchist named Ak, who helps you, but will eventually turn on you, inevitable betrayal scene. Um, and not only that, she's going to sully your reputation and all these kinds of things. So that has sort of lasting campaign impacts if you want to use that. And where the portal leads you to is actually Undermountain. And there's some NPCs in there that make it sort of interesting. This one's pretty good. Um, you probably are outsmarted by Ak because of the way this is all written up. She sort of has a pretty decent way of, of escaping. So unless you have a way to kind of counter these things with through high-level spells or something like that, uh, she gets away and then you're going to kind of clean up your 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 reputation i don't know if that's fun i mean you know you want to think through whether your players like the overall premise of being tricked Mm -hmm. do they like the cleaning up your reputation if the answer to those things are no then probably tip off what's happening and maybe create some mechanism by which those npcs in undermountain who are also quite interesting could have an interplay between the party and you and ak and and come up with a different way to to thwart this or even get ak on your side um but I think the idea of going through Undermountain is quite clever. And yeah. the idea is this portal will get closed up by um, the various NPCs later. So it's, it's just a temporary thing. Well, it's, um, it's, it's good that they you know, acknowledge that while here is this really cool planescape setting, it is connected to everywhere. And so mm-hmm. you could use it in your campaign that you're running in these other realms as well. Yeah. So chapter 10 is finally the last part of this whole Takarim saga. Those people who are experimenting on the Modrons, taking off the parts. Uh, The villain Valren from that previous party adventure is there. Um, And I, you know, this is one of the things where you're, it's sort of strange because you're like, well, is the idea to play all these adventures across all these levels slowly, you know, or am I really supposed to just play these piecemeal? In which case, why do I care that there's a recurring villain and plot and, so it, it, the adventure fights itself in that sense. But we uh, go to, to the fiery plains of Ghana. And there we have a fantastic giant flower made of metal. <laughs> mm. And that is itself the dungeon. And you have to go in there and destroy the place to stop the mad experiments. There's some you know loose angles here. But I mean, it, this is a fairly straightforward in terms of what it's trying to do. So if you like going in and exploding stuff... I would lean heavily into it from the beginning and just say, that's your mission. And this is tough. You've found where they exist. Go get them, you know? Um, And then the last one is the last leg chapter 11 rumors suggest the Modrons have a powerful artifact that gathers data on the planes as they march. Great concept. Not true. (laughs) So (laughs) you are heading to do a thing that isn't a thing. (laughs) It's always touchy. Uh, But along the way, you will meet a Modron named eight which is a really unclever mm-hmm. name. Like, I'm sorry, out of however many Modrons there are, eight? Yeah. Okay. Um, so bad passwords abound in the, uh, <laughs> in the Modron world. Yep. Uh, so you go to the Iron Cubes of Acheron, which is a really cool concept. These Iron Cubes flying through space and people fight from one cube to another. And you have to stop the plans of an animated suit of armor named Kragus. No matter what you're going to do, Ada's is going to die. And at the end of it, reveal that Primus is dead with its dying gasps. Um, final programming, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, and that's the whole point of this. And this is one of these adventures where it's written for that last piece. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is like DM rookie thing, right? Like right. I'm doing this entire adventure so I can have an expository piece at the very end. And it's like, well, why? Why? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I would I would highlight the Akron style of things. There were some third edition, uh, at least a third edition adventure I played that was an Akron mm-hmm. where uh, Akron Akron, where it was a lot of fun dealing with these different cubes that oh, move yeah. through space and, and the endless battles. I would lean into that. Um, I guess it's fine if you're if you I mean if you make the combat hard enough, the Modron will probably die no matter what anyway. But I don't know that you'd need it to die to reveal this to you. It's a rogue Modron. I can just tell you. Right. You know, maybe you want to have a friend and have <laughs> eight live with you and it's the last adventure. So let it live if it should, you know, right. Fine. Right. Yeah. It's like I said, in the last episode where we talked about this, this is a great outline for a novel uh, <laughs> that would tell a wonderful story um, as a D and D adventure. If you're going to run it, I would love to run this 
uh, for fifth edition players. I just so much work would need to go in creating yeah. the encounters that have a meaningful impact on the story and are meaningful to the players and the characters, the choices they make and their successes and failures that actually bring the meat of role playing to to the game. Yeah, I mean, and this is one of these adventures that gets talked about a lot, which is why we looked at it, right? And, right. and, and for folks who, this came up on a YouTube comment where someone said sort of like, why did you pick an adventure that you don't kind of like? And it's like, well, because this is a talked about adventure and it's kind of, it, it, and it probably, if not fifth edition, some edition is going to come back to this because I think it's a neat enough concept. And a lot of times it's it's worth knowing about it, both as a fan, as a designer, you know, what is the, what is it that we were trying to do here? And the concept of a, a is, you know, and, and this gets revealed at the end as well. There's an epilogue, which is for DM only, where the dark shadow that we talked about last time that sort of had taken over Primus, it relinquishes its role as Primus. Primus is dead. There will be a new Primus now, uh, now that the shadow has left. Uh, the shadow itself seems sort of changed somehow by having been so lawful momentarily. It's looking for a thing. It has clues as to where it is, thanks to the Modron March, and it goes off to find this object. And the next sequel then takes you to the to the next steps of this. And as Sean said, this is a great novel piece, but none of this sort of matters except to the DM. And it's the kind of thing that even if the DM tells the players, the players will go like, okay, yeah. you know, we had nothing to do with that. Yeah. If this were redone, I think it would be really cool if you knew more but you had to go through these events of the march mm -hmm. to figure out the truly put together the clues, right? Imagine if all of these steps had been almost like the rod of seven parts where you're mm -hmm. gathering these pieces together, whether it's right. information or a thing or whatever, maybe finding a Modron in each scene that, you know, can, 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 come together to be a whole, like some mecha Modron right. or something. I don't know. Like just finding a piece of a Modron in each <laughs> thing that you're able to put together to build one yeah. uh, that can reveal some cool things that you know what that is that's taking lore teos and it's make it's gamifying <laughs> actionable it. yeah making it actionable boy i wish someone yeah. would write an article about oh, that oh man i tell you <laughs> too kind yeah and that's that's what i think uh, so you know why what was the whole point of covering this the whole point of covering this i think was for sean and i to kind of go like okay you know, what can be done with this? And is this a worthy story? And, and it is, there's a neat story here that could also be a story that works for the PCs each step of the way and takes us through the planes, which is a cool idea, right? Like there's so many planes that most players have no idea about. This gives you a taste of them, sometimes really in a really great way and sometimes very poorly, right? Yeah. So that would be the, the fifth edition or sixth edition, whatever edition touches this could do so in a really cool way. And who knows? I mean, this is the kind of, clearly Chris Perkins likes this story. So mm -hmm. for all we know, he's working on this right now. Yeah. I can't add anything else to that. So I will say thank you, Teos, for taking us through this final part of the Great Modron March. And thank you to our listeners out there. Thank you too to our patrons. If you would like to become a patron of the show, you can support our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash MMP. Uh, Teos, you have been doing some writing and some social media stuff. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, Sean. Uh, you can find that blog post on actionable lore at alphastream.org. You can find me on Twitter at alphastream. Sean, where can I find you? Uh, you can find me sitting on my butt at home. Mm. But if you have access to the internet, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin. You can go to the forums at forums.misdirectedmark.com. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube on the Misdirected Mark channel. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter at Mastering d, d Mastering Dungeons is a Misdirected Mark production. So Teos, we've done a full circuit. We've gone through the plains along with the great Modron March. What are we going to do now? I think we need to march again. It's time. Bring the Modrons to 5th edition. We will march on uh, eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> Do you say something?